Hey guys, Ryan from Spiker Workshop, and in this video I'm going to be diving in pretty deeply to how I use this injection molding machine, and also how I make uh, molds, and I'm going to be showing you how I made my most recent product in my last few videos. You've probably seen these uh, one six scale tracks for a half track RC truck. I want to be showing you kind of an overview of how I made these molds for this track. And then after that I'm going to show you um, pretty much every detail there is about injection molding machines in general. I'm going to show you the inside of this machine, how the electronics work, and some modifications I had to do to this machine to be able to uh, make this mold work properly. So I'm going to get started right away. So the first thing I want to talk about um, is the CAD that I actually had to create for this track. I'm sorry I don't have a desktop recording program installed so I'm just going to just point the camera at it. <laughs> um, so this, this link... Um, so this is where the track actually comes from. This is the, the real life truck. And you can kind of see the shape here. Um, I started by using a bunch of different um, images that I found online. Like here's one of the, the actual tracks and here's the end result from it being molded. It's very similar that it came out. Um, my friend helped me get some measurements off of a model to use, you know, as like rough dimensions for what size they should be in scale. And yeah, I won't I won't go too deep into the CAD stuff here because there is tons of other, you know, information about this. Or yeah, the the program I'm using is called Fusion 360. It's uh, actually free from Autodesk. Um it's free as long as you make less than I think it's like 150,000 a year or something like that so it's pretty much free and yeah you basically make the CAD through uh, a series of sketches and extruding and stuff like that and I also use some um, freeform tools to get the actual 3D shape um, but yeah I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go into that too deeply but I will show you the um, CAD for the mold. Let's see this one here. So here's the actual mold. Um, two part obviously because of how complex the geometry is and the parting line for this mold was really difficult because the the shape has this undercut area right here. Um, as you can see, the this this surface right here, like I, I couldn't make the parting line like a even just you know flat on both sides like I have some other molds I've made. Even on this um, hole right here, I had to have the parting line like come over and then down, and then up and over, and then it made it even more complicated with the fact that this hole here there's like a weird extra undercut. So what I ended up doing to solve that is on the mold here um, I had to create these pockets and then these like extrusions that come up um, and these shapes like interlock with each other. Um, let me show you here. So yeah, like as the mold closes, those shapes had to, you know, interlock with each other like that. And then I made it so for the hole that's an extra undercut, I actually drilled a hole through this part, like after this whole thing was machined, I, I put the, the halves together and used a drill bit to drill through here. And so that created another challenge where I couldn't simply 
have the injection machine open the top half um, because the pins that run through here um, to make the holes for the tracks I actually use um, pins so the injection molding machine I had to develop a thing that would actually pull the pins out of the mold before the mold opens so the part can eject freely if that makes sense so that, that was the main challenge when doing this whole project. And then this, the second challenge was making sure all of the these pockets and extrusions would actually fit with each other and not um, allow too much plastic to squeeze out between the mold halves. It's called flashing when uh, plastic like oozes out between where it's not supposed to be and you get like a film and uh, th thankfully so far I haven't run into any issues with these tracks um, but yeah here's where it actually fills so the the extrusion machine the nozzle comes in and injects the plastic through here and then from there it flows through these channels here and fills up the cavities and uh, one thing I didn't notice until after the whole mold was done was that the injection machine doesn't actually put out enough plastic to fill this mold which I simply didn't know because I haven't made a mold this big yet so what I ended up doing oops sorry I have the mold here what I had to do was actually close off one track because I can fill three tracks but not four so it wasn't that big of a deal but I hope I don't run into any issues because I, I haven't actually run the three track part yet um, the tracks that I've gotten out of this mold so far, since I wasn't able to fill all four, I just lowered the plastic amount to just fill the center two. Um, it still worked fine that way, but um, in this video I'm going to be doing another injection run to see if three links will work. And uh, one of the other challenges was figuring out how to get a nice surface finish in the mold. And what I ended up doing was um, I got a sandblaster, which I'll have some clips I'm going to insert throughout the video of um, just snippets of me machining this and sandblasting it. But this sandblast, I used uh, glass beads, which actually made it look really nice. I didn't bother sandblasting everything just because it, it does take a long time. You only have a very small area that gets sandblasted at once. Um, so yeah, that pretty much covers the basics of what I had to deal with when I was making this mold. Um, let me show you some of the tools I used to actually make it. So here's the cam for this mold. Um, it's uh, computer-aided machining. And uh, Fusion 360 has some amazing tools for doing this, which is one of the main reasons I used Fusion 360. Um, Here's some of the tool paths here that um, are all these uh, tool paths are just to cut out this one mold here. Um, I'll just go over it pretty briefly because this is also another subject where there's tons of other videos on. Um, but basically I uh, um, face the whole thing, um, use different adaptive tool paths, and what that means is Fusion 360 will, will keep the cutter engaged with just a percentage of the material at all times so it will never like plunge into the wall which puts a lot of load and stress on the bits it does this kind of weird um, circular path and that way the the tool slowly ramps in and out each time it, it takes a longer a lot longer to cut but it's you know I'd rather wait longer and not have to buy another $40 end mill, you know. So for me it's worth it. Um, and then I slowly step down between like quarter inch and then here I'm going down to a eighth inch end mill. And what's also nice is Fusion 360 it like looks at all the previous operations. Like this for example is a quarter inch and you can see it machines this pocket, but the quarter inch radius can't quite fit in there. 
So when I do an eighth inch toolpath, it will come in and, and just clean up what the, the previous toolpaths could not reach, which is pretty cool. And um, I don't know if the camera can see that. Um, let me zoom in for a second. All these numbers here, this is the amount of time each one of these toolpaths takes. So in total, it's a decent amount of time to machine all these things. Um, the smaller you go on the bit, the longer it takes typically to cut. Um, let's see here. Yeah, and then I go through. Yeah, the uh, ball, eighth inch end mill. Um, you typically use a ball end mill on stuff that is 3D shaped, so it doesn't leave any hard edges anywhere. Yeah, there's quite a few different size bits that are used. Here's the really small one millimeter. And just to machine these few holes took 21 minutes. So it's the smaller you go, the slower speed you gotta use. Plus it doesn't help that my mill can only do 2500 RPMs. So the smaller bit you go, low RPMs, you really have to go super slow. Um, and this this here, I was just surfacing off the part that would mate with the other part, like the, the visible um, surface. And then after this, I took it to the sandblaster and sandblasted it. And then I put it back in the mold, or I mean in the vise on the mill. And then I um, finished up all the other operations. And I, I left some material on... Um, all, all the other parts of the mold that weren't the actual piece. So that way when I sandblasted it, I only sandblasted the actual cavity of the part. And then I came back and cleaned all that up. Um, so it would, f in, in theory, it would fit nicer together with the other half of the mold. Like smooth machine part on machine part instead of um, sandblasted parts on each other, you know. And then, the this is the very final operation. Um, this is the tapered end mill. It's a one millimeter, or one degree taper. And I have that, that go around all the interlocking profiles. So they, eat, they all have, you know, like a taper to them, so they connect easier. So there's, there's a lot that goes into just making one of these molds. Um, there's a lot of thought you got to put into it to, to make sure you don't screw up on any tool paths because you know one one screw up on any of these numbers or, or uh, parameters you, you know you could have to start all over or something thankfully it went pretty good for me but here's some of the all these all these settings add up into the one cut um, but yeah there's there's tons of other YouTube videos that go over you know, how to actually work all this stuff if you're interested in doing anything like that. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was the, pretty much the exact same setup for the other half of the mold. Just, um, slightly different shapes. So, to actually machine the molds, I used this, uh, mill that I converted into CNC. It's a Precision Matthews PM25MV. Um, I bought the mill through um, Precision Matthews directly, and then um, I'll put some links in the video or in the description for all this stuff too. But the the CNC conversion kit was actually from a company that is local here um, in Minnesota, where I, where I live, and they made um, these aluminum motor mounts, and they came with the stepper motors and. Um, different screws under here. They use uh, nice industrial grade ball screws on this thing. And I added in the limit switches and I custom machined a extender. This is like a big saw block of aluminum here. Um, because the head 
didn't actually reach out to the center line of the table so you only had about like I think it was like five inches of travel so adding that got me to a full six inch travel width on the table and uh, this is the controller that came with it this uh, Servotech box has all the electronics and then you need a, uh, a standard PC to run it so I, I built this enclosure for the machine also um, it has sliding um, polycarbonate uh, doors just in case any drill bits ever break or end mills break nothing will come flying out at me and then the PC that runs it the machine runs on Mach 3 which is a really standard uh, CNC control um, interface and you, you can manually move the machine just with the uh, arrow keys and shift makes it go faster and it's pretty crazy how how, uh, how much torque these motors have because just this table just this long table by itself weighs like 60 pounds so like this is a small mill but it's still really beefy for what what it can do and uh, Sorry, I gotta use two hands to make it go up and down. And in here right now I have this extra drill chuck chucked in here, but normally the end mills are about are right up here. And I got um, several different call-out sizes. Like this is what it uses in there. Like this, you can put the 1 8 inch size end mills up in there. And here's some of the bits that I use to actually cut the mold out. Um, I'll normally start with the big half inch one. The half inch end mill does all the roughing stuff just to get the... Uh, like when I had to do these, these raised parts, the half inch one got all the material you know down to that level. Then I'll use a quarter inch for other things, and then I slowly work my way down to um, like the eighth inch, um, some of our ball end mills, and um, some of the, the small detailed areas I had to use a one millimeter extended reach just to get down. Like when I machined the, uh, the pockets for the, the track guides right here, this thing was used to make the corners a little sharper.
Check out these nice quality taps. Uh, I get these from McMaster. Um, if you guys do any tapping, um, I forget the exact name of them, but see that that kind of uh, angle at the end? That's when you know they're nice. Um, watch what that angle does here. This is an M3 screw or tap. See how that comes out on the bottom? You don't even need to lift the, the tap out like you do with those cheap ones. It just comes out like a little string. It's pretty, pretty sweet. Um, it's worth spending a little bit more on nice taps like this for sure. And then this bit it's a tapered end mill. It's got a one degree taper to it. This end mill is what's used to finish up all the walls that actually like interlock with each other. So when they connect, it's uh, you know a slight taper. So as it gets close, everything kind of squeezes together and, and seals up. And um, it took me a while to get these mating halves to work right. Um, I had to keep one of these in the vise and then I kept um, just running it slightly more and more material off for each pass on one until it actually would seal up and fit. Right here I can show you that. So right when it bottoms out um, you can't move it anymore because all those tapers like fully locked together and then you can see here these are the holes where those pins have to go in to actually create the holes in the tracks and here you can see the main issue I had to overcome um, this pin here to make the hole in the track you can see it's it's raised up off the surface because the tracks in the in between there so that's why I came up with the idea to drill a hole sideways through here and then as the pin comes in here then when the plastic is injected these have to be pulled out of the plastic and then the part can be released and then that creates a hole and the way the tracks are assembled they use um, nails that are the exact same diameter as this rod so when the plastic shrinks a little bit when it cools then the nails have a nice press fit in there and then for the other end of the track these um, are actually slightly larger rods that I use and that way there's not a press fit on the other end 
and what I had to do to overcome even that because my injection molding machine didn't have any sort of mechanism to pull pins out I had to come up with um, this whole design here you can see I have the pins right here in this block um, this is where the molds actually get installed this this half is um, where the plastic comes in from the cylinder and then the other half here so when this mold shuts those holes on top of the mold get aligned with these pins here and then I used two actuators and these actuators will lower the pins in the mold once it shuts and then they'll raise them out um, I found that when the or after the plastic gets injected the pins are under really high tension from the plastic like shrinking around them so these cylinders they're like 225 pound lifting capacity each and it takes probably two to three hundred pounds of force just to pull these pins from the mold so this it looks overkill but it, it needs that much force and uh, you, you guys will see that once I get to the actual injection part of the video um, so yeah to make this pin pulling device work because obviously the uh, the controller of this machine wasn't set up to do any of these tasks I had to go in the machine and add in a, a whole bunch of circuitry to um, basically control the sequence because you don't want the mold to open if all those pins are in there um, because of the way that the mold is because if, if all the pins are in those holes and then the mold tries to open you know that's not good it's not going to open properly so I had to make a system that would make sure to raise the pins up before it opens and I didn't have any access to you know the source programming that they they used to make this machine so what I ended up doing was I put in an Arduino um, actually I'll just open I'll take the machine away from the wall and show you guys the inside of it so here is the back side of the machine I have the door panel off and I'm very glad they put wheels on this thing because although it does not look like it this machine it's uh, 930 pounds shipping weight which is pretty crazy the tabletop and the bottom plate are all steel and all the components on this thing they're just so massive um, this part I actually took out of the machine to be able to drill this hole to put my um, actuators on here this plate was probably like 75 pounds or something it's pretty crazy um, so yeah on the inside here um, there's quite a lot going on there's the whole air system because the all the um, pistons and stuff like the uh, injection cylinder and everything all this stuff runs on air you can see a glimpse of some of them up there just huge cylinders pretty much as big as this whole box and then those are these blue things are the stepper motor drivers um, there's a stepper motor used to turn the screw that feeds the plastic and also those four rods there there's a stepper motor in the back of this unit with a belt drive system and that you can use the the control board to actually move the mold forward or backwards you know to compensate for th short, thinner or thicker molds so that whole system is pretty sweet and then we got the transformers there I believe the heaters run on 70 volts um, I'm not 100% certain on that but the back side of those they did say 70 volts so I don't know if they're tying them together or what but that was also confusing because the machine itself 
runs off of 220 volts. I had to put in a um, special 220 outlet for this thing. And then over here, these two boxes in the back are the main control control units for the uh, like that's the touch screen from the front. And I'm not sure exactly how those work, but I did have to tap into those for those modifications I was talking about. And then I think those are the three heater relays because the the barrel has three individual heating elements that you can control. And then I love their wiring that they did in this machine. Um, it's just so clean. They used all these um, channels to hide all the wiring. And then the air side uses um, just a bunch of different solenoids in different configurations. Um, like, like this one's powered to open, um, or closing and opening is being powered. And then I think um, some of these, they just release the pressure to close or something like that. Not totally sure on some of these air systems, how they work. Um, I know these are mufflers, so when the machine releases pressure, um, that's where some of the air will come out to release pressure from the cylinders. And then on the front, there's a control valve to control how much pressure, and that controls just the pressure that's going to the main injection cylinder. There's actually two two cylinders, and it controls the pressure for basically how much force it uses when it actually injects the plastic. So you can adjust that. And then um, all the stuff on this white board here, this is everything that I had to add. So like I was saying a second ago with the, the pin pulling device, um, I needed to make sure that the mold would not open if the pins were down. So I had to tap into the main controller unit and see like when the controller tells the mold to open and then I used a Arduino and the Arduino actually took over control of the mold closing took over control of the safety door and um, the inject or ejector pins to actually pop the part out of the mold and I had to I, I've got these boards on Amazon um, one of them here is a, a MOSFET uh, four individual control MOSFETs um, I am using two of these to control the solenoids for the air like um, I think it's this one here this one is what controls the opening and closing of the mold this one controls the ejector pins which is that one right there so basically I had to write a whole bunch of different code to split up um, and add more logic into the machine so like the Arduino um, knows what's happening so I actually went in here these actuators they have limit switches built in so you simply supply power and then they'll stop on their own when they reach the top or when they reach the bottom and I tapped into the top end of that and then that signal is also being sent to the Arduino so the Arduino will know when the pins are up and then it can instruct the door to open and then when the door when the uh, the main controller wants the mold to close um, I just have it close and start lowering immediately and then in the the software on the control thing you can set a couple different settings so I was able to um, delay the actual injection cycle for like 20 seconds because it takes about um, like 15 seconds or so to actually bring the pins back down in the mold and um, yeah all this seemed to work really well um, this this board here is actually a motor driver um, each one of those actuators is being controlled through here and um, there's really not much to that. Um, I, I did a lot of coding on the computer to control the different states of all the stuff coming in. And then I also added I added this switchboard to the front of the machine. It's got three status lights, 
just so I can see what's going on in the, the brain. And then there's three switches. So from the front, I can tell it to um, use the pin puller or not, because not every mold I make is going to use that device. So I can completely turn it off to make the, you know, the non-pin molds go faster. And then on top of that, um, one of the things I didn't talk about yet was this machine, it uses a safety door. So when this door closes, um, I think it's stuck over there. There's a, a magnet that trips this reed switch here. And um, by default, they set up the controller so that when you are in full, like, automatic mode, uh, the machine will not advance to the next cycle until you manually open and close the door. Um, when you do that, then the machine will start immediately doing the next inje injection cycle. Um, but for me, I wanted to be able to make it completely hands-off, like fully automatic. So there was another challenge that I had to overcome was the reason they did that was they wanted to make sure that the part actually fell out of the mold properly. Um, and what I did to, to make sure that that happens is I put in, it's called a beam breaker. Um, there's an IR sensor and an IR transmitter on both ends of the chute. This is where the parts will actually fall down and out. So the Arduino is handling all that too. So when the Arduino um, uh, sees the signal to eject the part from the mold, it starts watching for this beam to be broken. And if the beam's broken, that means the part should have fallen out of the mold. You know, nine out of ten times, I hope. Um, it's not the most robust system, but it, it has worked so far. I might add in some other sort of safety check just to make sure the mold never closes on a part that it's already has in the mold. But I, I have the Arduino check for that, and then when the signal is broken, um, then the Arduino will manually... Um, it, at first it checks to make sure the door is closed, but then the Arduino will toggle the door open and closed to trick their controller into thinking that, you know, you actually opened and closed it. That way the, the entire machine becomes fully automatic, and you don't have to... Um, you know, do that manually. And so far it's been working. I've had it run for probably t maybe two or three hours total so far. And it's worked with minimal issues. Sometimes a part will get hung up in there, but then my beam breaker never trips. So I make the machine um, halt itself. Um, I give it like, I think it's 10 seconds or something before it will time out and halt the machine if nothing happens. So, I mean, it seems pretty safe and, you know, not destroying parts or molds. And then none of that will happen if you physically open the door. Like, if this is open, the Arduino will not advance the mold cycle, even if it's in full auto mode. So, yeah, there was a lot of stuff that I had to do to this just to be able to, to make... Um, these specific molds for these tracks and um, yeah so far it seems to have worked um, w one of the reasons I even went s into so much detail to, to doing all this is because I'm gonna be making a lot more track molds and all my track molds will utilize the same system of pins the only thing you need to replace for different molds is the block on top um, I just have it clamped on there just because other molds will be different lengths and different spacings and stuff so I didn't want to I didn't want to leave it so you could screw it on and have the screw be in the way later or something but yeah the whole system is really modular um, oops, sorry um, here let me get back to the front of the machine so another thing that I had to customize on this was this whole setup here um, I had to, because there's, there's a, a certain limit to how far this can open. 
um, when you when you have these screws rotate to adjust the mold it can only go back so far and it can only come forward so far so I think my limit is like the max mold width I can do is like an inch and a half and then the minimum is I think a half inch or maybe a little less than that so I had to design some sort of um, modular uh, mold holding system in here so I had to figure out the correct spacing these are steel these came with the machine and I added all these aluminum parts here and this whole block here is held in by this clamp system um, so you, you can like fine-tune where these are to line up with this piece and this side I, I took this this is also steel I took this out of the mold and then on my mill I uh, machined holes that were very specific widths apart and those holes match the same holes that are on this side and what these are for is so I can do molds in I think four different widths so I can do a four inch six eight or twelve inch long mold and here I have these are the three molds that I've done so far this was my first mold a four inch one and these were um, some snowblower gears just to see if it worked and thankfully it worked and then my second mold I did was um, for the snowblower drive gears and in this mold I kind of included what I already made just so it would be in one run and this this was quite a long cut to cut these 3D teeth out I think it was like 30 hours of cut time with that really small end mill and these are the parts this is one of the injection pieces that actually came out of here and this this came out like perfectly like these are um, sellable snowblower gears and then the next mold I made was the the track mold here and this has the 12 inch spacing and unlike most molds um, I did not use um, pins to align the mold um, for two reasons um, this the setup that I made in the machine like this never moves so these alignment holes are always perfectly in line on both sides so I use the, the countersink head like of the bolt this is what actually lines the mold up as it gets tightened down you know that countersunk hole will bring it in perfectly in alignment and then also since this this mold has interlocking parts um, these interlocks are kind of like uh, guide pins to line the mold up so yeah that's that's uh, what I had to do to get all that figured out so now when I make future molds um, I can use the same you know spacing of, of hole sizes to fit any mold in here and then one other thing I haven't touched on yet but um, each one of these molds needs a ejector plate made for the mold and what that is is when the plastic injects in here you need to get the part out of the mold so these pins go in the mold like this here and then um, the spacing for the mold um, the spacing right here um, this the space between the like ejector plate and the front of the mold um, I have an exact copy of this setup that I use when I actually set these pins because I don't want to take these in and out of the mold each time I make a new one so I think that might have been a little confusing what I was just talking about so I thought I'd show you um, I have an exact copy of what's in the injection machine it's the same thickness and the same shape and here's one of the um, pin plates or the ejector plates so when I first make these ejector plates I'll put them in my copy of what's in the machine and line it up like that 
And then I'll take my mold and put them on the pins here. If I can get it lined up. And that way, that's the same exact spacing that's in the injection machine, just so I don't have to take that in and out each time I make a new mold. And you can see here how the pins, um, for these track links, uh, the ejector pins, one of them is in a fake bolt. Like there's a screw that sticks up on the track, and I use that as the ejector pin. And then also two more ejector pins on the sprue that runs between the tracks. And like I was saying before, I closed off the fourth link just because my um, shot size on the machine wasn't large enough to fill the whole mold. It came really close, but couldn't quite do it. Um, and yeah, when you put in new pins, like this for example, um, I've machined one of the tops flat, so then um, after you set it in there, I use a, a punch and a hammer and it gets press fit in the aluminum that's below it and then you can set it to the right height you know and then once I take this out and put it in my or in the machine um, all these pins should be at the exact same height as they are here so when the pins get pulled back in there they become flush with the inside and then when it wants to eject the part, um, it pops them out like that. And I made it so it's just one bolt, and there's a stud here, right there, and it's got a spring on it. So you screw the ejector plate into the stud there, and then that spring will help bring the ejector plate back down. And then this air cylinder, this will tr uh, trigger in between when the mold opens and the part gets ejected, um, that pin will push this plate up. So then it, you know, the plate comes up and the pins push the parts out and then it goes back. Whoops. And then here's a, another one of the pin plates. This one I had some difficulties with, with the pins um, sliding on me. So I tried to use some JB weld to lock them in place. Seems to have worked, I think. And these ones actually used some larger pins just to push that gear out because that pocket was so deep in there. And this you can actually see easier that the pins go flush with the surface. Like when it's in here. You can see that they're flush because the plate's back against that wall there. And then when the that pin in the middle comes to eject them, it would come out like that and push the part out of the mold. Um, so yeah, so each mold I have to make, each mold comes with a uh, accompanying a pin plate that I have to make for it. And then when I make more track molds, um, I'm also going to have to make another pin block to line up with you know the whole spacings um, so yeah sorry I'm kinda going really deep into all this stuff but um, I figured a lot of you guys out there would probably find it pretty interesting um, so I'm going to get the machine ready to do an injection run for some more tracks so I'm gonna go ahead and put the plates back in the machine so I also want to quick talk about the air compressor that I'm using. I actually got a new one. Um, it's from California Air Tools. And this thing, you can still hear me totally fine talking over it running. It is like just crazy quiet. Um, I'm going to put a link in my videos for this because I, I bought this on Amazon. And it uses like really large diameter um, cylinder heads, two of them. That's why it's able to be so quiet. The, uh, the larger cylinder diameter doesn't need as high of an RPM, so it runs a lot slower, but it still fills up really fast. Um, this is their 8-gallon right here, and this thing keeps up with the injection molding machine just fine, which is nice. 
Okay, so I have both mold halves put back in the mold here, in the machine, and the ejector plate. And I have the machine preheating, and I got my, um, my ventilation system running. I ran a duct that goes outside to vent all the fumes out. And I'm using a Tupperware bin as like a hood and it covers all the areas that will get um, up to temperature to have fumes come out. Works really well actually. And um, I don't have the machine pressurized with air yet. Um, whenever I put in a mold for the first time I always like to just manually move the clamp close just to make sure I don't have them misaligned or something and um, I can show you how the, the clamp mechanism works while I do this oh yeah what's cool is they have a I don't know if you can see it from here they have a plate um, yeah that plate right there there's a hole and a, a plate that drops down over that. So when you have the door open, and if for some reason the mold was told to close, um, that safety pin would not allow the mold to close. Now you see when the door shuts, it will raise that plate up and down, which is a nice safety feature. Yeah, here, here you can see the actual uh, mechanism for the mold. Um, it uses just one air cylinder that's back here. And it doesn't actually go under tension until like the last quarter inch or so. Yeah, I like to get them all close, um, just to make sure it shuts right. Yeah, you can see how the mechanism works. So all the leverage is being done by these joints right here. So, as the mold's moving, it's not very strong. It only comes under full tension, you know, right as all these um, joints are locking up. Um, but yeah, I can see the mold aligned right, so I won't have any issues with that. So now I can show you the actual pin puller in action here. So from my control panel, um, to turn the pin puller on, um, when the mold is closed, um, these things start lowering. And you can see they go in the channels for the pins right there. And that way now all the pins are locked in the mold, so um, the tracks you know, would have the, the holes formed now. Um, I'm actually going to open that back up though. So I have the machine pressurized now with air and it's opening the mold now. And let me show you the ejector pins here. So that's what will actually pop the part out of the mold. Um, the barrel is, I think it's at temperature, um, you can see this is where I set the temperature. Um, there's three heating zones. Um, right now the temperature is higher because it was just warming up and it kind of overshot, so now it has to cool back down a little bit. Um, but while we're waiting, I can add the plastic. So this is what I use here. Um, this is Delrin in resin form. It's like um, pellets, basically. I got some white and black stuff. So I'll fill up some here. And the hopper is where we put it here. You can see the screw down in there. And 
so I'll kind of go over the basics of how this machine actually works. Or how any injection machine works, that is. So, once the pellets are in here, um, this part is what's heating up here. The three individual barrels are heating elements. Um, there's the actual nozzle where the plastic will come out. And the way it works is inside of here there's a screw, a very specific shape of screw. And um, actually I'll start feeding it just to show you it here, this feeding button. That starts that motor spinning, which is turning the screw right now. And that's feeding the plastic from the hopper down through the screw. And the screw shape changes, so the farther it gets in the barrel, the, the um, more compressed the plastic's getting. So it's actually being mixed together right now and heated as it travels down the barrel. You can see it start to come out there. Um, I do a fair amount just to purge the old plastic because when you cool the machine off you can never get all of it out so you gotta kind of get the old stuff out of there. And the, the very first run that you do um, right now the um, even though there's plastic in the screw it's actually empty um, like it can't do an injection shot, it needs to build up plastic in front of the screw. Think of the screw like a plunger. Um, well, let me just show you here. So, to, to make screw or to make plastic build up in front of the screw, um, for now I need to block the nozzle and have the machine move forward. Um, that way, no plastic can get out, so I can feed plastic and allow the barrel to fill. So I'm going to start feeding it. And you can see right here, this is the, the whole screw is pushing the machine backwards right now. And in front of the screw, um, plastic is piling up almost in like an injection shot. Like this is what they talk about for shot size right here. And on the control surface, you can set how many millimeters of shot size you want to use. It uses this, this actuator here to measure the distance that it's actually filling up. And this, this setting was for two track lengths, but now that I'm trying three, I'm going to up this. I'm not sure what value to use, so I'm just going to try something and see what happens here. So. As I'm feeding more plastic in, you can see that the barrel is moving back. So once it gets to 65, then it automatically stops. So now the machine's ready to do an injection shot. So I'm going to pull the machine back, get that out of the way, and clean off any extra stuff on the nozzle. And now it is ready to inject some. So one thing I'm not sure of is since I'm doing a new setting, I don't know how much plastic to use. So if it uses too much, it will push through the mold halves and create flashing. And from there I can adjust um, several different things to try to fix that. So for now I'm going to just do one. Or actually no, I'm going I'm to set it in full auto mode and get it ready to do the whole injection. So here I'm turning on full auto mode. So it will wait for me to close and open the door once to start the whole cycle. Um, I'm just going to quick show you some of the settings here. You can set how much time it waits for the mold to close and the injection delay. I have it set to 20 seconds to make sure there's enough time for the pin puller to get lowered all the way down. And then there's cooling time, but I add that into the pin pulling up time too, so it's about 30 seconds or so total. And yeah, let's see what happens here. So 
So I open and close the door and it should start. So the mold closed and the pins are going down. Now the machine moves forward. The actual nozzle mates up with that. And then you, you'll see the the two big cylinders here. Yep, do the actual injection shot. And then immediately after it injects the plastic, it will start feeding plastic for the next cycle. So now it's filling back up the um, screw. So the screw is moving back and putting plastic in front of it. And then while that's happening, the plastic that was just injected should be cooling in the mold. And hopefully we don't get much flashing. If we do, I'll have to change the setting for the next run. And then you'll see once it is done um, how much force is being used to open up those pins, to pull the pins out. Doesn't sound like a lot, but that's like two to three hundred pounds of force to pull those up. Alright, so this is what actually came out of there. So it looks like I am getting some flashing here, and this one didn't quite fill up all the way. So, just from looking at this, I'm not sure if it can actually do three links. Um, I might have to block off that other channel and just do two. Um, because the way it is now, the plastic, um, by the time it gets all the way out here, it's not even anymore. So that's why we're getting flashing over here and not enough over here. So I might um, cut the video short here so I can go back and fill in the other fill in the other half of the mold so only two links are being injected. Um, but yeah, you've seen when that part fell down, it tripped that beam breaker and told it it was safe to open again. Let's see it one more time here. That one actually came out a lot better than the other one. Less flashing and fully um, fully packed in the mold. There still is some flashing though. So I'm going to tweak the machine and um, I'll get back to you in a minute. So a quick update. I've been casting out a bunch for a while here. I got a decent pile going. And um, I just ran into an issue, which I gotta stop the machine to fix. Um, my ejection, ejector pins, they're all moving. Each injection cycle, they're moving a little bit. So I'm actually gonna stop the machine and I'm gonna have to fix the injector plate. Um, like the other one, I had a similar problem where I had to use JB Weld on it. Um, that click sound, if you could hear that, that was the pins moving. And basically all it is is the ejector plate. I just press fit them in the aluminum, but there's so much pressure in there that it's actually pushing them down. So I'm going to have to do what I did with these and actually JB weld them in place. So for now, I'm going to shut everything down and fix that. And, um, yeah, I think um, the, the video did a good job on covering a lot of the different aspects of injection molding. Um, this, my, my background is that I have no prior experience to an injection molding machine besides this one. So there's all sorts of stuff to learn still, obviously. And, um, yeah, I'm going to... Turn off injection or auto mode. Um, but yeah, it does work decently. There's just a few bugs to iron out. I got the 
um, flashing issue. Sorry, the flashing issue slightly under control. I lowered the temperatures by like I think five or ten degrees, and the slightly lower temperature didn't let the plastic squeeze through. Um, this is the best one that I've got so far. There's just a very small amount of flashing on the end, and then some of the plastic squeezed in between that um, that patch I put on the mold to block off the other fourth link. And um, you'll notice the end one, the trackpad is actually um, nicer looking than the other two, and that's because the way Delrin works is it needs to be packed, is what they call it. So I kind of screwed up the whole mold's uh, flow by sealing off this fourth channel. Um, I might go through and seal off this link, because that way it's symmetrical. Um, the reason they don't look the same is it's not symmetrical right now. Um, the, the, yeah, that's the main issue. So I, I might go through and figure out something else with that. But these are the links that I got so far from this run. Um, they look pretty good. Some of them had just a little bit of extra flashing, but this was before I lowered the temperature. Um, but this stuff cleans off so easily with a knife. Just one slice and it's all gone. So you're, if you get these for me, they might have just a little bit. Um, so yeah, I covered a lot in this video. Um, I think this might be a good place to end it. Um, yeah, one other quick thing here is, um, in order to shut the machine down, um, since I couldn't finish doing a full injection run, all the plastic that's in the barrel right now, I have to purge from the barrel, um, which kind of sucks, but there's no other way, it's going to take me too long to fix those pins, and you can't leave the barrel at temperature with Delrin in it it'll start to de degrade within about 20 minutes and it actually lets off um, a really toxic gas if it's left that temperature for too long. So um, I'll probably do this off camera but I'm gonna take some of the beads out that I can reach and then I have to feed whatever's in here out to purge it and then um, yeah, I'm actually going to turn off the barrel right now. It only takes about five minutes to heat up, but it takes like three to four hours to cool down just because there's so much metal here. So one thing about all the um, plastic that is not used for the links, like I've, I've been saving um, all the sprues that I cut off, all these and any failed ones, like ones that I had the settings wrong, and um, like all the little tiny bits even of Delrin that I, I clip off of the good ones i um, saving all this stuff and eventually I'm gonna get a machine that can um, grind it back up because you can mix you can mix reused or you can mix uh, Delrin that's been used at least two or three times I've heard um, in with brand new stuff so there's virtually no waste to this machine. Um, even the, the stuff that's purged from the barrel I've been saving. So I can um, remelt all that stuff and use it in the future. But um, for now I'm just saving it because I don't have a machine that's capable of grinding it up yet. But I will be getting one eventually. Same with the white stuff. Um, there's a lot of failed white parts just because this, this was when I had no idea how to run the machine. But all that will be saved and reused. Um, I might even be able to reuse... Um, this is the, the Delrin that I was using um, before I was injecting these parts. I was just machining them directly out of Delrin um, sheets. So even all this stuff I should be able to grind up and remelt in this machine. Because th th that was a lot of waste um, when I was machining them. But I've been saving all that stuff, too. Um, but yeah, I think I'm going to end the video here and get all this stuff cleaned up. 
Um, let me know what you guys think in the comments. Um, I tried to go as detailed as I could to kind of give everyone, you know, a bunch of information on these machines and stuff. So yeah, let me know what you think. Um, thanks for watching.